Welcome, gentle reader, to this episode of Everything is Everything. Thank you for being here with us. Um, Amit, you wanted to build on from our previous episode that was called The Reformers. Tell us what you're thinking. Wait, need coffee first. But that was quick. Now, the, you know, change came quickly. I have my coffee. I am now <laughs> ready to talk. And yeah, so at the end, uh, one, The Reformers was an episode I really loved. I thought it's one of our uh, best episodes, partly because the story means so much to both of us. But at the end of that episode, I remember asking you that, hey, these people who fought for decades uh, without immediate reward in sight and often against a tide, what made them do it? And in that episode, you gave a fairly lucid answer of why that was the case and why they were motivated the way they were and etc, etc. And I buy that. But I've been thinking of that since and looking at the question in a broader frame and specifically two broader frames. One is that can you help me with the framework of how we think about change in general? And I mean change at a, at a large scale, at a social scale, if you want to actually, uh, you know, bring about great change. How do you sort of think about that and approach that? And that was uh, question one. And question two also was that if I am doing something, and that may not necessarily even be a quest for social change, but if I'm doing something that involves going against a tide, that involves, you know, uh, what Robida, my favorite philosopher, had a great song about this where he said, So if you tread a path that involves akla choloing, then, uh, you know, how does one approach it? So, what are sort of your thoughts about this? A good classification scheme is to think of a change in the people or a change in the state. Okay, they're two different things. So, in every uh, society in the world, there is the state and the people in the state. You know, should I really be the agent of the people? All too often, it's upside down. The state becomes a ruler. Uh, so it's interesting and important to ask, what is the process of change in the state? And what is the process of change in the people? And mm, for most of us in India, I would just say that by default, we tend to make a mistake that we are excessively statist. We tend to think of only Sarkar. We tend to think of government. We tend to define the words state and the people and mix them up and we think of them as one and the same. Okay, So we say silly things like India won the World Cup. Like, excuse me, some guys won the, won the World Cup. It had nothing to do with either the people or the state. So this conflating of Vishwanathan Anand and the people and the state. It's good to unbundle these. They're three separate things. Some bloke won some sports match, there is the people of India and there is the state, it's good to separate them. And then if you think of a better world, you think of a better society, if you think of purposive action to make the world a better place, then a very important site of that activity is the people. Okay? And because we're so statist, we only think of the state. But actually, most of the good things happen in the people, almost all the truth and beauty and creativity happens in the people. So it's in the society that all the rot lies, Okay, that the crushing of freedom, the almost casual behavior that erupts all too often in the Indian society. All these are social ills and they're equally important or they're five times more important. A fundamental idea for us should always be how can we the people do things ourselves? How can we form the culture, the associations, the networks, the relationships, the firms, the clubs, so that good things happen in the society? We shouldn't always run to the Maibab. So if anything, the state is less important than the people. And I just want to encourage everybody to you know, get their priorities right. So, you know, you uh, mentioned that the state should be the agent of the people, but it is often the other way around. So, I've remembered this great Bertolt Brecht poem called The Solution, which I will now read out for you, which is about exactly that. The Solution. After the uprising of the 17th of June, the secretary of the Writers' Union had leaflets distributed on the Stalin Ali, which stated that the people had squandered the confidence of the government and could only win it back by redoubled work. Would it not in that case be simpler for the government to dissolve the people and elect another? 
right? Great uh, sort of poem by Bertolt Brecht and in India we have it again the wrong way around where the state rules us instead of serving us, blah, blah, blah. And I, I want to sort of double click on that theme of how does change come? Does it come from society or does it come from the state? Because it is of great relevance to us in the sense that at the very birth of this republic, we began by making the assumption that change will happen in a, in a top-down way. We, you know, brought to life a constitution which um, Ambedkar himself described as only a, as a mere topsoil, where he accepted that society is deeply illiberal, but we'll have a relatively liberal constitution and keep them in check. And that was sort of the thought of it. And, and the way many people have sort of written about the constitution later, again, has that same uh, top-down kind of vision. You know, our friend Madhav Khosla, who did an episode sort of the scene in the unseen with me talks about you know the pedagogic uh, effect of the constitution as if the people need to be taught how to live uh, you know it has been described as a transformative constitution and i object to all of this because what we now know and obviously you and i can say this with hindsight but what we now know is that it it can never work from the top down and gandhi ji i think was wrong about many things but one thing that he was certainly right about is that change has to come from within society it has to come from the bottom up and I think many people stopped trying to build uh, that better world where they brought that constitution into being because their thinking was, hey, we got the British out and now we'll, uh, you know, change whatever needs to be changed in India from the top down with the constitution, with the Maibab Sar Sarkar. And today, any reasonable person would know and understand that that doesn't work, even though it might have been fashionable thinking uh, in that time. And the other thing that I think about and I've thought about a lot in the last few years is that there was a time and I have changed and uh, sort of refined my thinking a little bit. But there was a time I used to think that people like you and your colleagues in the policy world would not achieve anything. My thinking was that, look, if you want change, then you uh, attack the demand end of the political marketplace, not the supply end of the political marketplace. And the state, of course, is at the supply end. You know, supply responds to demand. Mm -hmm. If you can make the people want something different, if that clamor comes from within society, give us more freedom or give us whatever, you know, it is more likely to happen. Uh, otherwise, you're trying to change it from the supply end, it's pinpricks. Like I said, I've modified that position a great deal. I think even small incremental changes at that supply end can have a massive impact on society and you need both, not one. And another unrelated context in which I think of it is people correctly, and here it's a question of getting the description right and the prescription wrong, people correctly will talk about all the things that are going wrong in technologies and say we need to regulate the tech giants because it is, you know, they are, um, uh, you know, they are using us as data, they are addiction machines, etc, etc. I agree with all of that. The description is correct. But the prescription they commonly come up with is regulate them. And I could not disagree more with that. Because once you open yourself up to the principle that the state will tell private companies what to do and what algorithm to use, things can go very, very wrong. Because imagine that power in the hands of the worst person you can think of, and not some benevolent person who wants a good of everyone. That is what will happen. So when I think of those problems that, uh, you know, so ha have possibly been exacerbated by social media, like our tribalism, like the echo chambers we form, like the polarization of our discourse. My belief is that these are social problems and must be solved from within by society. Now, I don't have a particular magic bullet solution to any of these, but I think it is dangerous, as we do in India, to always think of a state as a route to get there. Uh, I was actually after a somewhat different thing. So let's play a couple of elements of this. I think at foundational values, it can only come from the people. That it is the people that have to wake up and speak up and live the life of greater freedom and greater openness of mind. There is no other way because, you know, the state is not going to meaningfully move the needle in on those issues until the people change their position. So, for example, all over the world, uh, movements on decriminalization of homosexuality and gay marriage really happened when the state and the representative political systems followed the people. That the opinion polls showed the people moving and in democracies, the views of the people matter. 
Okay, I mean, Mr. Putin is going doubling down on homophobic laws because he doesn't care for the views of the people. But if the views of the people mattered, then over the years, as there has been a greater space and openness of ideas, the states have followed, and you can see that vividly across how many countries have moved positions on these things. So there I am fully with you. I have a subtle disagreement on uh, more practical questions of policy. Let's take our favorite subject, globalization. Okay, So it is an absolutely fundamental principle in economics that more opening up to the external world is a good thing. Okay, That free movement of goods, services, ideas, people, capital, all these things are healthy and beneficial for the country. If you have more foreign companies operating in your country, they bring better products, they bring knowledge, they hire people who get taught the technology, the management, the processes of how those companies work. And in time, this knowledge gets diffused into the country. This is a very strong idea in the world of the thinkers. It is not comparably well established in the world of the people. It is very easy for a demagogue to appeal to nationalism and say anti-foreigner, and you'll always get some mileage. So progress on these kinds of things tends to be an elite project. It tends to be a top-down project. What tends to happen as was the case in India, is that we had a stall of the economy. We hit a wall in the late 80s. It became crystal clear that the autarkic ways of the Indian state of interfering with cross-border activities were working badly. And all over East Asia and other parts of the world, a more open approach to globalization was working better. And then through the thinkers and the politicians, these ideas started turning into reality. And this is the intellectual capacity of the leaders who are, of course, part of that world. So when you look back at the world of Vajpayee and Yashwan Sinha and Jaswan Singh and Manmohan Singh and Chidambaram and uh, Narasimha Rao, there was an intellectual capability in that group of people where they basically got these messages. It is very easy for a feeble mind to slip into anti-foreigner. So anti-foreigner comes readily. Capital controls, government will ban this, government will control this. You know, these things come instinctively. So this is an example where it is actually an elite project of developing the diagnosis for addressing a political need, the growth had stalled. Okay, So when growth stalls, you get that widespread misery in the country as we see today. But then it is an elite project to diagnose that and to come up with a batch of recipes. So I think all these things have to be in play and I don't want to claim primacy for anyone. You need all these things to make a good society. We need the people who will work in depth one person at a time and persuade people. You need people who will work in the world of public policy and there will be sometimes the citizenry screaming around certain policy restrictions. Sometimes it will be an elite project of persuading people that, you know, this really doesn't work. We need to change course. Uh, so I'm not trying to diss anybody. I'm saying all these are important projects of the change makers. My sense is, to, I mean, I agree with you entirely. I mean, I, I don't think you were really disagreeing with me in that sense. I, uh, everyone has a role to play. And I guess my lament is that while all of these, um, uh, you know, different agents of reform have failed us in a sense. I think by and large, barring a certain period, the elites have failed us. Uh, by and large, these ideas haven't gone out um, uh, into the public. But I think that there are still some elite reformers I can look at and some vestiges of an elite project which made this move towards change. And my lament is that in popular culture, we don't have enough of them. But it can be done. You mentioned globalization in the context of globalization. I would now like to play you, dear reader, a famous song that is about the glory of globalization. Here you go. Mera juta hai Japani ye patloon Englishtani sar pe laal to piru si pir bhi dil hai Hindustani So Ajay, you know Martin Luther King once said that the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice and implicit in that is um, you know a sense that 
in the long run we will progress we are going in the right direction whether it is justice or freedom or whatever uh, you know even if it's really slow like there's another famous saying about how paradigms change one funeral at a time meaning you you can't often convince other people but over the generation you may have changed and the assumption you and i made and certainly i made and i was wrong is that in the long run we go towards progress you look at um, uh, you know what francis fukuyama called the end of history though he did it with a question mark and all of that in 1989 where the soviet union's gone the berlin wall has broken down and suddenly we are in an age of liberal democracy and things seem great and we're all going to be free globalization is on the march even india starts opening up right and today a lot of those things have reversed and turned around authoritarian governments are on the rise everywhere uh, and so on and so forth i hardly need to elaborate but certainly uh, you know we are not necessarily progressing and i wonder that when we make an assumption of progress it's actually not a scientific assumption because if you think about it the sample size on which you base uh, base that conclusion is a very small sample size how many years how many centuries have there been why should we necessarily uh, progress I used to think of the enlightenment project as a way in which we mitigate our hardwiring in which we bring nurture to counter nature we use culture to uh, you know combat our genes and obviously we are hardwired for many contradictory things some of them are good some of them are bad uh, the good ones uh, steven pinker would possibly term the better angels of our nature and my assumption was that all right we are the one animal who, where we can rewire ourselves and that yes as you have said in the last episode we are indeed monkeys but we are monkeys who can change and become on something better and i wonder about that because much as you know we can amplify the better angels of our natures we can also you know give rein to our worst demons we often see a lot of what social media does for example as amplifying our worst in- instincts of tribalism of othering people etc etc um, so what is your sense about like how should we think about progress so it, uh, you have to choose the time scales on which you want to play and you can get reasonably different answers here are some phases uh, where i felt in a certain way uh, when you think of the scientific revolution it is just magic that you know nature and a mystery is lay hidden in the night god said let newton be and all was light it is almost magical how we went from uh, newton through to maxwell's equations through to modern physics to relativity okay that there is a period there where the world opened up and suddenly we could see okay and in that same period we got darwin as well so suddenly in field after field it felt like we had got eyes for the first time that we we were blind ignoramuses before that and suddenly the power of ra- reason has been gifted to us it felt magical uh but when you look in other aspects of life it's not that clear that there is a simple idea of progress in more recent years it has come to me as a great shock that the childhood story that we are told that humans were some savages who were hunter gatherers and then they graduated to agriculture okay and that agriculture was seen as progress and then from agriculture came the industrial revolution okay this is a story we are told as children modern thinking has moved in many ways against this view and in fact in many many ways the life of the people got worse with not better with agriculture and this is not widely known and it needs to be stated very clearly that the hunter gatherer life is a bit of a paradise okay people were free the women were free and health was good the male skeleton attained 6 feet okay and the female skeleton is like 5 feet 7 okay these are not things you get back until the 20th century and with the rise of agriculture it's like all hell broke loose we got disease the male height the female height shrunk we got social control of human beings we got the destruction of the happiness of women women became property women became controlled we got social regulation of women we really lost out on the entire life experience of women and grain was central to the creation of early states and early states were pretty disgusting projects because there was no magna carta there was no rule of law so it was just state oppressing the people so when the state went after the people it was taxation and conscription okay two nightmares that were brought by the state the state 
wasn't a sensible creature that worked for the people. It wasn't an agent of the people. It was a ruling class which created the monopoly of violence and had uh, caprice and whimsy in how it inflicted violence on the people, which sadly is a description of many states in the world that we see around us today. And that was the creation of agriculture. So by all accounts, life got terrible with agriculture. Agriculture was not progress. So if you think of a long darkness from the discovery of agriculture in Babylon about 5,000 years ago to the emergence of modern liberal democracy, probably 19th century UK. It is just a dark regress in that period. If you had to choose a year to be born into, you would always choose a hunter-gatherer period. That was a better life. We were free. Okay, we were healthier. And there was no state there to oppress us, to tax us, to conscript us. Getting conscripted to go into a war is a horrible thing. So it took me time to appreciate how wrong our childhood programming was. Uh, similarly, it is by reading James C. Scott that I understood that for a lot of people in history, the project was to be far away from a state. That when a state came up and it grabbed territory, the response of the people was to run away. Why do you want a state that will inflict violence on you, that will conscript you, that will tax you? What good is that? Run away. So the people tried to run away. And so you get this whole concept that states care to grab people. They want people to oppress, not territory. This whole lines on maps is a silly modern idea. Actually, what every tyrant wants is more people. Because if you control more people, you can oppress them. And the people will exert their best interests and exit, meaning they will vote with their feet and try to leave the bad states. It is better to live in a state of anarchy where there is no state than to live with a tyrannical state. Again, this is all very disturbing and it is not consistent with the simple idea of progress. Okay? And then you get to the 20th century. So, you know, in a way, the great idea of liberal democracy was put to test in the 20th century. And, you know, you and I are old enough to remember how terrible that period was. And it is not a done deal that, you know, we had the First World War, the Second World War, we had the Russian Revolution, we had Nazi rule. Nazi stands for nationalist socialism. It's like the two bad ideas fused into one. And uh, in some parts after the Second World War, Europe blossomed, many parts of the world blossomed, but the threat of communism was alive and well and there was no telling when things could go explosively bad, when you know another country could suddenly turn communist or we were presented with the threat of nuclear war and a global destruction. And so it was that in 1989 when the USSR collapsed, it was an incredible moment of hope all around the world, that for everybody in the world, whether you are the people of the USSR or the people of Eastern Europe or the people of Western Europe or people like us living in India. It was a moment of hope, saying this long nightmare of the 20th century has ended and now, you know, we're done with this stupid warfare where some people are trying to make a communist country and now common sense will prevail, good sense will prevail, everybody will become a modern market economy located in a liberal democracy. Okay, For some time, there was this hope that it would happen everywhere. But here we are in 2024. And this is not true. It didn't happen. And by many measures, uh, there has been a decline of democracy and the possibility of progress all over the world. Country after country is experiencing that polite, but brutal phrase, democratic backsliding, which is when your quality of democracy goes down. This is happening all across the world on a large scale. There's a variety of measures. You can quibble about the measures, but nobody can doubt that the extent of freedom, openness, fairness in the political system has gone down in country after country. And so I want to appeal to the 20th century and choose a correct time frame. I choose a time frame of one life because I say selfishly that's what we care about, right? So 
imagine gentle reader you are 20 and you have one life in front of you or imagine gentle reader you are 60 and you have the rest of your life in front of you uh, that's a planning horizon that's a life you got to look at so now take a random sample of the 20 year olds of the 20th century take a random sample of the 60 year olds of the 20th century and you know what for large fractions of the people the rest of their life actually went terrible and you know for me it has become a guiding principle that social and political catastrophe is always possible if there's one thing we learn from the 20th century it is that political and social catastrophe is always possible so you should never get lulled into the notion of progress there are no guarantees when progress happens it's nice but there are no guarantees you know or look at us in india when in 1947 we had one of the most amazing post-colonial settings of the whole world there was no other country that had people like Gandhiji and Nehru and Tagore and Ramanujan. Okay, like we were the star pupil of what post-colonial experience was supposed to be. And you know, look at where we've come. So there are no guarantees, and progress is not certain. So I just want to say that uh, it is important and essential that we should dream of progress, and we should wonder how can the world become better we should care about the world becoming better we have skin in the game but we should not get lulled into thinking that it's locked in and it's going to happen and you're sure and you just have some millennial fervor that no no it's going to happen there'll be some minor ups and downs no like imagine you're standing in germany after the first world war there was an immense flowering of freedom with the weimar republic starting from 1918 it turned into Adolf Hitler in 1933. Okay, Imagine you're standing in the Soviet Union at the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. You're thinking everything is going to be great. We're finished. This nightmare of communism has ended. The country broke up into pieces. So wonderful. Estonia is free. Latvia is free. Ukraine is free. Okay, This thing, the whole nightmare of the 20th century is ended and we are starting over. We'll get it right this time. No, you didn't get it right this time. And you know, Russia collapsed into Putin. And even Poland almost went wrong. I mean, now Poland is coming back to its feet. Hungary, in the center of Europe, is turning into one of the most disgusting countries of the whole world. So, there are no guarantees. Things can go very wrong. Think of China. 1978, Deng Xiaoping began a program. And, you know, he was trying his best and he was a very smart person. But all in all, his program did not work. In 2012, you got Xi Jinping. And it is a return to concentration of power, to absolutist one-man rule, a crushing of freedom, a destruction of all the pieces that made China great. And today, the entire Chinese story is up in confusion and turmoil and there is no telling what is the way out for China. How will they ever find their feet again, even if Xi Jinping vanishes from the stage tomorrow? There is just no telling about how to get back to the path of becoming a good, strong, civilized country with people and state coming together and finding their peace. And there are wonderful stories where South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, you know, found their feet. Everything became great. These are wonderful countries that really got the people and the state. Everything has come together and it has risen. But I'm just saying there are no sure things. So I feel that we should be skeptical about the word progress. We should strive for it. We should endeavor for it. Whether the unit of change is a person or a small community of a few people or change on a bigger scale. Okay. We have skin in the game. It is both good values and self-interest to try to make the world a better place, to try to make our little world a better place. As Gandhiji said, uh, be the change that you want to see in the world. Okay, It has to always start with us. So I'm not dissing the project of change, but I just want us to be a little cold and careful and nervous about the world. I am reminded of what Thomas Jefferson once said about the price for liberty being eternal vigilance. You know, it, it and especially you can take other things for granted. You especially can't take liberty for granted because always power is pushing back against you, and always so many of the ideas that we hold dear, like spontaneous order and the positive sumness of things, are counterintuitive. So that fight for them is constantly on. You know, Margaret Thatcher once said that uh, you know there are many battles you ha you can't just fight once. You have to keep fighting again and again. So, you know, you know, so that's a sobering thought. Every generation has to fight its own battles. I'm trying to remember uh, who was the person who came out of the constitution drafting project in the United States 
I cannot recollect the name. And somebody on the street asked him, what have you done? What, what have you given us? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's a great way to put it, that you have to keep it. I mean, every generation has to fight for that freedom and dispersion of power, the idea of a republic, the idea of rule of law, the idea of constitutionalism always hangs by a thread. And there are no guarantees and, you know, there can always be a collapse. I mean, hey, in 2022, we are back to large-scale, high-intensity land warfare, the kind that we had thought would never happen after the Second World War. And here we are in the 21st century with that kind of war. So I'm just nervous about that millennial sense that progress is inevitable. A naughty thought once struck me, which might be too flippant for such a serious episode. But I thought that in a sense, it is good that we are not progressing, but going backwards and we are surrounded by bad news everywhere. Because the creator economy is booming. And Ajay Shah, we need content. <laughs> yeah. Like if there had been no war in Ukraine, what episode would you make? What episode would we make? So Ajay, you're not you're not actually sitting in front of me in an armchair, though you are sitting in front of me in an armchair. But what I mean is you're not being an armchair gyani and, you know, giving dope about the world. You've actually worked within the system. You worked in the state for 20, 30 years. And, uh, you know, you have seen that process of change play out. You've been a, an agent of change yourself. We've had that, uh, you know, you and Renuka Sane were on that episode with me where we discussed the pensions reforms. You've spoken about a lot of the other stuff that you've done. My great episode with KP Krishnan is, you know, um, uh, an outlining of what uh, your posse of people did in a sense over a period of time. How does a state change? Take me through that process. Show me the engine room because sitting here on the outside, everything seems incredibly glacial to me. And, uh, you know, some change does happen, but it seems arbitrary. And today certainly sometimes feels like we're going backwards. Yeah, uh, It is important to have a theory of change around the working of the state. And I have intensively studied this subject by watching many, many projects of policy reform and also the kind of projects where I was a participant or I was present in the room. So I think of a policy pipeline that runs from left to right. And left to right is a sequence. It is an ordering that you can't jump the steps. you got to go left to right. And that straight away is a cautionary story because all too often people go wrong. They try to jump to the end and they haven't done the early stages. Okay, so let's start. It starts at data. Okay. All change starts at data. If you don't have data, then you are vulnerable to ignorance. Worse, you are vulnerable to spectacle. Okay, So there is a bunch of people in this world who are able to create spectacle and will just paint any nonsense picture. And we will all be vulnerable to that. We will be deluded. So the process of change, the beginning starts at data. That the first step in any society is the measurement that you got to know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, it's game over and you will never be able to identify problems. You will never be able to embark on any feedback loops of progress if data is not done. So the first task is of establishing data. One after another, we need pillars of measurement. If there is a field you care deeply about, your job is to first build measurement systems. So for example, if you believe that air quality in India is important, very well, you need to put in about a generation of time, meaning about 25 years of time, to build a proper measurement system around air quality. Okay, And you'll say, but we can't wait 25 years and I will say, yeah, what to do? Okay, So you can't short circuit this, meaning no amount of moral fervor or urgency can substitute for data. Without the early stages of this pipeline, which are more knowledge intensive, we get into this caricature that there is a crisis, something must be done. X is something. Let's go do it. Okay, That's so, a line from Yes Minister. Yeah. So there is a great bait and switch that happens in the world that when there is a great moral panic that, oh my God, we've got to solve X. That is the time when the most cruel, oppressive things are rushed through by the state because the people are deluded and in a moment of fear, they just want some authority figure to tell them that, hush now, child, I'm telling you what to do. Okay, people don't want to stand on their own feet and be responsible for their own life and be responsible for thinking. People are too willing to accept propaganda, to accept spectacle as a substitute for truth. So the starting point has to be data and we have to build measurement systems. And this takes long time. 
And uh, one of the realizations is that in less developed countries, oftentimes a government run measurement system doesn't work too well because it is easy to snuff out government led measurement. So it's good to think of many, many ways to do measurement that will actually create information in society that is not within either the problem of state capacity where governments will fumble and fail and will honestly do an incompetent job or will snuff out measures that paint the government in poor light. In this, I want to draw the attention of everybody to the glory called satellite imagery. Okay, The bird in the sky sees the damn truth. It's a revolution in observation. Yes, you can't observe everything through satellite imagery, but there is an explosion going on. There is a great world opening up. Um, unsurprisingly, it is very difficult to get your hands on imagery from the Indian ISRO. But without any friction, there is beautiful, great amounts of data being released by uh, various satellite providers, both public and private, elsewhere in the world. And they see India and there's tons of data that can be obtained about India, about Bangladesh, about Sri Lanka, about Mozambique, about every country of your interest. So that's a very important revolution that expresses the essence of the kind of thing one would like. Not, I'm not implying that satellite imagery substitutes all human-based data. You do need human-based data. But this gives you a flavor that satellite-based imagery is a way to bypass the government. Neither do you need state capacity in the government. That, you know, do we have an ISRO that has the wisdom to create and release imagery for free download by users all over the world? Unfortunately, currently, the answer is no. But there are others in the world who are doing that. So you can go and get that. And the other is the ability of... Uh, government in a poorly working country to snuff out or distort the data that is not to their liking. Very quickly, give me an example of an insight that you've got from satellite imagery. Um, the, this could be an entire episode uh, of EIE at some point. There are just hundreds of amazing cool stories about things you can measure from the sky. Let me show you some. Um, uh, we have worked. Give me one example. We'll do a separate episode later. The satellite uh, sees the Earth on a pixel size of half kilometer by half kilometer. It takes a photograph at 1.30 a.m. Okay, Now at 1.30 a.m., the lights there are the lights of street lights and petrol stations and the lights at the border of a commercial complex and so on. So the lights at 1.30 are correlated with prosperity. So... The bird in the sky gets you a monthly picture of prosperity at a half K by half K pixel level. It's an unimaginable level of precision in seeing economic prosperity in India. That's one example. I, there are hundreds of examples. This is a field where we have worked. We are at the global frontier of improving the NASA methods on how to process this nighttime lights data. So this is a field I know well. But there are innumerable other stories. Anyway, back to the pipeline. Pipeline. The first step is data. If you don't have data, it's game over. You will just have opinion. You will have impression. And the guy with the biggest megaphone will win. So everybody will have nonsense. And the guy with the biggest megaphone will win. And generally, the modern world is structured so that the worst guy has the megaphone. So you will surely have wrong impressions. Like whatever is common knowledge is generally wrong. Okay. In almost any field, when you get the microscope going, Everything that is loudly stated by all famous people is wrong. Okay, so fame is a curse. It interferes with information. Okay, the next stage is research. So then you need the mad people who will study that data and develop knowledge about the world, who will develop deep insights into the world. This is generally classified into correlations and causation. And both are important. Okay, so I absolutely do not dis mere correlations. That's just the foolishness of some part of the economics profession that somehow mere correlations are considered uninteresting. Correlations are incredibly useful and incredibly important. You need to know how to interpret them. You need to be cautious in the interpretation. But it's very interesting to know facts about the world, to know correlations about the world and to develop insight into the world. There are many, many paths to insight. 
In fact, I have a useful correlation with a fantastic insight and the correlation is that the number of total hours watched of everything is everything has been going up at the same time that India's GDP is going up. So, the uh, pro, you know, the prosperity of our nation relies upon us. Of everything is everything. everything, is everything. <laughs> I'm sorry, continue. I couldn't help that. Yeah. So, that's the next stage that there is data, data everywhere but not a thought to think <laughs> and then there is the research stage which churns that raw refinery, the unprocessed data. Okay, So, the pipe that comes out of the CMIE is the crude oil and then the research stage is what is the refinery and that's where you create useful products and that is knowledge and that knowledge can feed back to understanding the world for purposes all across the landscape including the state. Okay, Now, you come to the third stage saying we have good data, we have good research insights, we understand the world and we have identified a malady in the world, it has to be a market failure, Okay, meaning other things are not the business of the state, but we have identified a market failure and we have started thinking, you know what, how could we do something about this, can there be purposive state action which will do something about this. Okay, And again, at that level of sophistication of the data and the research, we would hope that there is an intellectual community that is able to just you know brush aside a whole bunch of things that are not market failure that don't come to me with your pet peeve don't come to me with your personal value system okay don't come to me saying there are so many homosexuals in this country okay that's not a market failure that is the personal judgment of whatever people want to do people should be free to live their life okay that takes us to market failure now in this what you want is the lowest coercion the lowest cost ways in which a state intervention can be feasibly constructed that will help. Okay? So, what you want is an imaginative creative phase of inventing solutions and what is a good solution? A good solution is one that substantively gets the job done while costing the least and I always want to use the word cost as in either money or coercion and remember all tax money is made out of coercion so it's not different. Ultimately, the poison is coercion. The poison that the state drips on the people is coercion. So, you want to use coercion as little as possible. So, for the least input of coercion, under reasonable assumptions of state capacity, which is a euphemism for reasonable assumptions about state incapacity. Can we get the job done? Can we substantively get the job done? Maybe not 100%, can we get it 60% done? Okay, This is the puzzle at stage 3. That is, can we imagine solutions? Can we imagine designs? of state intervention that are feasible, that don't impose ridiculous levels of coercion that will not just bog down with unintended consequences and you need very creative thinkers who will imagine those solutions. Quick note for the gentle reader that we've actually done three episodes on the nature of the state which will be linked from the show notes and the second of those is actually about exactly about this that how do we think about policy, what should the state do, what should the state not do. So if you want an elaboration on some of what Ajay is talking about that's a place to go to. Okay. So, we need an imaginative stage of thinking of solutions and I have one non-obvious comment to make here. The machinery of formal universities, which is the subject of another episode of Everything is Everything. Fixing the Knowledge Society. Fixing the Knowledge Society. The machinery of universities as presently constructed does not do this step. It's just it's mysterious that imagining policy solutions is not the subject of the academy. Somehow, they pushed it out like... Yeah, and of course, the academy doesn't, you know, won't engage in policy solutions because that would mean they have to engage with the real world. And as we discussed, that is not their remit anymore. Yeah. So that is stage three, that you need to imagine multiple rival solutions. If a country is told there is no alternative, if you're told there's only one solution, you're being shortchanged by the intellectual community. There should always be many rival ideas. It's healthy. It is appropriate. I may have a belief that X is a solution to something, but if there is not vigorous content contestation in the world of ideas where other people have other solutions and we argue it out in good faith. If that argument doesn't take place, then you're getting shabby ideas. Okay, So when there is only one game in town, you have surely got a bad thing going. Okay, So we've flown from data to research to imaginative policy solutions to the next stage, which is there should be a public debate around these things. Okay, That there should be vibrant public debate where many people are arguing in a free and frank manner and this basically comes out of both the strength of the intellectual community and you know the number of thinkers that you have in the country and the freedom of speech because if you have a chilling environment where freedom of speech is proscribed then people will just shrug 
and you know they will pursue their own self interest and let it go like why fight if i'll get into trouble why will i complain so what you need is a cantankerous complaining environment in the public sphere where people are vigorously contesting ideas and criticizing the status quo if you don't criticize the world how will you ever make it better okay so that is part 4 that we need a vigorous public debate okay and this leads to many many policy proposals which are starting to bubble up and this is where the phrase overton window comes up that you need to widen the overton window that more and more people need to become comfortable that yeah you know x is a decent idea it should be considered or some part of x needs to be taken in at this point generally in india or in the india of old when we were a kinder gentler policy environment there would often be a government expert committee the job of government expert committees was to sift through this debate and examine rival views and find a middle road and mainstream a certain consensus so again and again government committee reports have listened to a debate and have generally supported more heretical ideas and made them more normal okay so the job of government committees is that you need wise people okay older people people with a with two feet one foot in the intellectual world one foot in the establishment in the world of doing who are able to listen to these debates and shortlist some feasible solutions and to help legitimize and make acceptable some of the more unusual ideas that were otherwise seen as oh that is too radical that could never be done that is so new I want to quickly for our gentle readers demystify the term of the Overton window for those who may not have heard it before the Overton window essentially is that you know is how you define and how you look at what is acceptable within the discourse today uh that you can uh, you know you can go to this extreme and that extreme and that is your Overton window but you can't go on that side or this side those are really extreme views and what uh, the phrase comes from shifting the Overton window is where you gradually shift the bounds of what is acceptable discourse uh, more and more to one side for example 30 years ago you know gay marriage would not be on the agenda it was completely outside the overton window today thank god it is and some day it might uh, you know even be just common place and one there would be no debate about it at all similarly i often joke with people that i shifted the overton window of duration in podcasts because once i started doing my 5 hour 6 hours episodes you know people 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 thought it's okay we can now do two hours three hours and so on back in the day when i started one hour was considered a deep dive but now one hour is like a miniature so i will take credit for that but continue after the stage of the public debate you come to the government committee reports and then you come to decisions most important decisions are encoded into laws in a good country elected legislators write laws in a bad country the joint secretary writes the law but any which way these are the people who own the country and you know so the in the indian administrative state legislators don't do much it is the joint secretary that drafts the law so all these inputs go to that internal decision process and some decisions are made and finally you want to come to the implementation stage in the implementation stage two things happen an idea is translated into a law so for example it is one thing to think inflation targeting it is another to turn it into a law it is one thing to think new pension system it is another to turn it into a law okay so as an aside my personal journey i thought about the new pension system but at the time i was clueless and i did not know what it meant in terms of its legal scaffolding so while i was a spectator while the law was being drafted i actually didn't know anything i was clueless by the time we got to inflation targeting i had the full legal knowledge so i was able to walk that full mapping from monetary economics to the drafting of a certain agreement to the drafting of a law by that time i had the knowledge of how to draft a law the last step in implementation is the organization design that if a law has been drafted how will you build a government organization that will actually meaningfully be able to discharge this law by default a government organization is just a waste of money and random casual uh, attacks on private people using coercive power how do you not do that how do you create efficiency how do you create accountability how do you create checks and balances how do you create a government organization that will actually deliver on the objectives of a law that is the last stage of the implementation so this then is the policy pipeline how does the state change it changes in every field through a journey of data research imagine imaginative people who dream of rival solutions of 
uh, which are the market failures and how can they be efficiently addressed. A public debate around these rival solutions, an internal government uh, committee process and a decision process through which more and more novel ideas get normalized and legitimized and turn into decisions and an implementation phase of drafting laws and designing government organizations that will implement laws. And as you can see, this is a wildly heterogeneous range of knowledge. Data is the knowledge of how to measure, how to build a statistical system, how to observe. Research is knowledge of statistics, economics, other social sciences. Imagining policy solutions is really public policy, public administration knowledge. Public debate is the podcasters and YouTubers of the world and the op-ed writers of the world. Government committees is a mix of high intellectualism and real world knowledge about how government works and how the world works. Then you get to the Indian administrative state where the joint secretary writes the law. That's a different skill. Then there is the drafting of law. That's a different skill. Okay. So to understand the idea of inflation targeting and to accurately draft a well-drafted law to do that is exotic skills in India. Most drafting of laws in India is really poorly done. Most lawyers in India don't know how to draft law. And then you get to the organization design, organization behavior of how to design an organization, how to get the management system of an organization right. This is closer to like organization design work that like a Bain Consulting or a McKinsey would do. Okay, All this knowledge adds up to the knowledge of how the state works and what is the process of change in the state. And there is no running away from this pipeline. If you don't have the data, you don't have the research. If you don't have the research, you are just proposing solutions based on your political preferences and not on understanding of the world. If you don't have multiple rival solutions, there can be no public debate. If you don't have freedom of speech, if you don't have thinkers, there can be no public debate. If there is no vibrant public debate, there was no competitive marketplace of ideas and then some shabby ideas will come through to the government committee process. If you don't have a government pro co committee process, you will not have that nurturing of radical ideas and normalizing them, of sifting through debates and coming up with a government-ish agreement that, you know, one, two, three are feasible ideas. And if all this does not go to the joint secretary who has to write a law, then she will write a bad law. Okay, and if you don't know how to draft laws well, you will get shabby laws and it dies there. And if you don't know how to build organizations properly that will have check and balance, it dies there. All this is needed and it runs from left to right. So, does it take 25 years? Yes, but there is no other way. Let me ask a provocative question. When I think of the 91 reforms, even if, you know, some of these ideas were in the pipeline and were being discussed by all the reformers we spoke of in the reformers episode, there was no public consultation. In fact, it all happened fairly quickly and, um, and, and so on and so forth. And a lot of the good reforms actually have happened fairly quickly without going through all these stages. I don't agree. And uh, so, the, 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 most so, of the 91 reforms did not go through public consultation. So watch me. Mm. Okay. So I could go do this in many ways, but let me take one of our favorite examples, which is removing customs duties. Okay, so removing trade barriers to the country. This is a hotly debated subject amongst the economists. You may not call them the public, but basically, I mean the people, not the state. The people, since Bhagwati and Srinivasan and Manmohan Singh's PhD thesis, since the 60s, this has been vehemently debated by the economists. There were always the lefties and the nationalists who wanted to do barriers against the world. And one by one, the research came out, the data came out, the research came out and the public debate in conference after conference, these debates were won by the reformers. So that by the time you got to 1991, for a whole bunch of people, this was a closed question. That There was only one way. You had to go from 350% duty to 5% duty. The only question was how the sequencing, it was a matter of implementation. But there were actually like 20 years of investment in the early stages of the pipeline that led to that simple clarity. The trade barriers have to go. There is no future for India without removing all the trade barriers. That was solved in the early stages of these pipeline, of the pipeline, starting from the 60s till 1991. But were all the reforms are discussed like that? Not all. But this I is mean, an that's example. What I meant. You gave me an yeah. example. I, I, mean, I gave you a good example. There are others that are less so. And by yeah. the way, many of the less so worked out less well. Because out of this journey, you get the refinement and clarity on knowledge. You also grow the people. The people who are involved in all this have the knowledge because the joint secretaries don't know much. 
okay it is the people in the society that have to have all this knowledge at this moment in time this very episode is being played on a giant screen in a large hall full of joint secretaries who have <laughs> gathered to you know to protest against everything that you are saying about them there there's nothing wrong with joint secretaries and you of all people with a broken ankle you don't even have all your joints <laughs> true So Ajisha, you know, earlier in this episode, we had that quote about how paradigms change one funeral at a time. You have controversially said and memorably said, society changes one WhatsApp uncle at a time. Kindly explain. So far, I was talking about the state, but we began this episode saying, no, the people are actually more important. The society is more important. Okay, we should not get wired into this statism. Okay, the I said that. the greatest problem of the modern world is the role of spectacle that whether it is celebrities or governments they have an ability to hijack our minds and it is our job to be self conscious and to push back okay and the state has a very high footprint in our life but actually it is the people that matter more all the wealth is created by the people all the art is created by the people all the truth and the beauty and the creativity lies in the people i mean the state can ideally help ensure that there is safety in the streets and sometimes it does not even do they that. can set up a commission to compose a sonata they can set up a commission to come up with a new raga which is nationalistic but i'm sorry continue yeah yeah so even more important is the people here i feel that uh, there is only one good feasible meaningful path which is that it is when we make eye contact with each other and we are in a zone of truth when we are in a zone of trust and we talk to each other and we argue with each other that's all that happens nothing else works so you know like will you uh, do advocacy for tolerance towards homosexuality using social media i think that gets nothing done that gets precisely nothing done this whole modern notion of a megaphone of the mass media and lot of shouting will be done i think it achieves nothing it doesn't persuade anybody it doesn't change positions it doesn't change anybody or anything what works is quiet careful conversations from one to another okay we each should embody the change in the world that we would like to see and other people will do as we do not do as we say so it's really about the truth it's about how we are with each other and how we gently keep persuading each other around what is our conception of good values and a good society and a good life um i have shifted my positions a lot around what happens in arguments and persuasion when i was a child i used to believe that i just have to show you how uh, starting from newton's laws we can prove kepler's laws and kaboom the world changes and suddenly you will reject all the superstition that came before okay so i used to think that a good clean argument and evidence gets the job done right there and that of course is completely wrong then i uh, switched into many decades of gloom where i thought that we never actually talk to each other we just talk past each other we politely smile at each other we try to avoid conflict and we actually never change our minds and we each of us are on some random walk of our own views and beliefs about the world and there is no possibility of persuading each other and that was also wrong it was excessively gloomy today now that i'm all grown up i have a superior understanding of the world so i believe that if we are in a zone of truth if we are in a zone of trust then we'll hear each other we'll actually hear each other um i will never be honest enough to say in front of you that you were right and i was wrong okay this is my human frailty okay i'm a stupid uh, monkey walking on the prairie and i have the inability to say that i was wrong so in front of you i will never admit that i was wrong in my own heart i will not admit that you were right and i was wrong leave alone having the honesty to say so openly that you know what that's a great argument you are right i will shift my beliefs in response to your cogent argument or in response to your amazing four line quotation from bollywood but i think that when we do conversations in a zone of truth in a zone of trust and let some time go by and the human mind will mull over it then we will update by 10% so 
So I will shift my views by 10%. I'll never shift my views by 100% compared to where you were. But I'll shift my views by 10%. Okay? So this is my theory of change today. And you know what? 10% is a lot. Okay, so if we can persuade 10 people in our lives to the tune of 10% on a couple of important things, I say great. So that is my theory about how society changes. Society changes in one great conversation that generates a 10% updation for both sides at a time. So, you know, right after this recording, I am going to ask you for 10 Diet Cokes. So, you change your views by 10% and give me one. Isn't that cunning of me? So, Ajay, I have another question for you. There is um, a, a sort of a famous quote that I love coming back to from Kashi Kasi by Kashi Nath Singh. And I'll give the family-friendly version of it here, where he says, Bhar mein jaye dunia, hum bajaye harmonia. Right, And the essence of that is the world is going to hell, but I'm going to play my harmonium. That is, I'm going to do what is good for me. I'm going to, you know, all the beautiful things that you speak of, art, beauty, creativity, cinema, literature. I'm going to indulge in all of it. I'm going to make sure I'm prosperous. My loved ones have a good life. Why should I care about the world when progress cannot be taken for granted, when so much effort comes to naught? Why should I dedicate my life to something where... Uh, you know, you only have one life, which is an, uh, a scarcity you can not do anything about. Now, one way of thinking about that is that people who are inclined to be like that, and I often am sometimes when I look at the state of the world, there's nothing you can say to them. What you can say, to, who you can address are the people who have that sense of purpose, who are saying that, Nahi, yaar, I want to make a change, but I want to figure out kaise. I want to figure out what is the approach I should have. I don't want to, you know, every day I have 50 reasons to get disheartened. How do I continue? What can I do? So, um, I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, you may not be interested in the dialectic, but the dialectic is interested in you. So, Sarji, for our gentle readers, that what is dialectic? What are you saying? Simple English. Mein bolo. Huh. You may not be interested in the world, but the world is interested in there you. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, first, I just want to paint a plain self-interest that you have skin in the game because you and your loved ones are in this world. You and your loved ones are in this society. And if the world goes to hell, you will lead a terrible life. Okay. So if you were in uh, Weimar, Germany in 1918, your number one job was to try to stave off uh, the nationalists. And in 1933, when the election results came out and Hitler won, your job was to take you and your loved ones and run away from the country. Okay. So... This is sheer self-interest that you want to know about the world. You want to understand the world. You want to have a theory about the world. And uh, if you don't have a theory about the world, you will just be one of the people that will get crushed when terrible things happen in the world. So I will start by saying that you may not have any great altruism reaching out beyond yourself and your loved ones. But still, it is efficient to know about the world. It is efficient to care about the world. It is efficient to know politics and form a theory of the world so that you will know in 1933 it is time to leave. And it is efficient to expend stupendous amounts of time and effort on staving off the horrors of what is happening in the world today. So that's my answer to the cynic. But let's turn to the uh, next part of it, which is how? Like, what can you do? Um, I feel that a lot of genuinely good, sensible, idealistic people are uh, making the mistake of burning out too quickly by going and banging their head against some mad bugger's wall and having their skull smashed in the process. And that doesn't work. And part of that, one of the reasons for that is because they have the wrong theory of change. If you believe in the idea of progress, if you believe the world is going to get better, then you feel like, look, let's just pitch in and push and it'll get fixed. And I'm saying, no, be cautious. Like Think more about what is the world that you operate in. That Go to neither of the two extremes. That Do not smash your head against that mad bugger's wall, but do, you, do not recede into apathy. And as I said, even if you have zero altruism in your heart, you have self-interest. And self-interest means you have to understand the world, the society, the politics, the state. Because you are a little breadcrumb in the eyes of that society and that state and they will chew you over if you don't act and if you don't think and make plans and decide. So, uh, I feel the first step is to think deeply about this grim, realistic 
difficult view of the world and pace yourself. So I feel it's important to find the moral philosophy of being able to stay engaged with these things for a long, long time. That you'll burn out if you try too quickly and you'll burn out if you believe the world will rapidly get fixed. The world will not rapidly get fixed. And then you need staying power. So you need emotional endurance and we need to have realistic expectations around what we can do, what we can achieve and the kind of change that will happen in the world and be realistic about it and not have crazy notions that I got X done. Okay, This is a vast world. It's a cast of thousands and everybody matters and we matter and it is our job to be good and to chip away in that. So the first message that I feel all of us need to think about is the case for endurance. The highest superpower is the ability to keep going. That, and that is related to don't ask for anything. Don't ask for a reward. Don't ask for success. The people that try to be transactional about it, that look, I put in so much effort, this should happen. Like, hey, screw you. You are nothing. Like, you are nobody. You have no right to ask anything. Yeah. So then do things in a non-purposive way and say, look, this is my dharma. This is my responsibility. I'm obliged to put in the effort. Beyond that, you know, what results will come out? One can't control, one can't predict. You know, we are all pebbles in the avalanche and we have to rescale ourselves to accept failure and defeat and bad outcomes. It's part of the world. And then don't be embittered and then don't get angry and don't turn around and exit that space. So that's the environment of sanity and care that don't ask for anything in return and rescale your mind and find the emotional capacity to be able to keep going for a long, long time. Uh, then on this subject, <clears throat> I think that it's very important to find fellow travelers. I feel we in the Indian elite are still at the early stages of understanding the word community. We're still at the early stages of developing community. We're still at a crude, credentialist, transactional stage of, you know, some people kind of peripherally knowing each other. A big project is developing the bonds of values and trust and the depth of relationships where people actually know each other and actually trust each other and will be good to each other, will be kind to each other. This community project is supremely important. And, you know, we each of us, we need our fellow travelers through which we'll be able to play this journey for a long, long time. And, you know, there will be ups and downs and we should practice the western way of war which is that you always take the war diaries and turn around and write histories and celebrate the successes and excoriate the failures and cry together about the failures and keep going that you don't collapse in a mess and you don't do silly triumphalism that oh we are so great oh we are so great you know you've got to honestly diagnose problems and talk about failures with each other meaning you have to be the person that tells me that I'm full of shit. That's the only way it'll ever work. You know? So in our closest communities, we need to build the world of truth, the world of trust, where we are able to honestly talk to each other and dispassionately look back. Look, we tried something. We were wrong. We went about it like this. That was wrong. We should have done this differently. If I could go back and do that differently, how would I do it differently? I feel that's a really great question. We should ask ourselves that kind of question all the time. That if I could write a letter that went in a time machine to the me of a certain year, what would I say? And that's a great exercise in introspection because it forces us to think, what did I do? Because by default, we are all trapped in ourselves. You know, we have, our egos are saying, oh, I did everything right. The world did everything wrong. I was perfect. I did the right things. It's very important to say, look, I'm giving you a bloody time machine. Write a letter to yourself. What will you do different? Suddenly, you know, it wakes up the mind that, you know what? X was a mistake. We should have done this differently. Great. Keep going. Tell me about the 16 mistakes. And, you know, with hindsight, you'll realize almost everything we do is wrong. And, you know, only out of that doing and that debate and discourse and a lot of crying, you'll come to the conclusion that, yeah, we should have done many things differently. And that is the engine of knowledge. That is the journey to knowledge. When we get into these feedback loops of doing something, failing, discussing, debating, understanding, then we as individuals, we as a community become stronger and in the future we are able to act better, we are able to think better and that's a big missing link in India. We are a country where there is just too much childish triumphalism. Oh, I'm so great. I did this. This is so perfect or oh, this is so bad. And There is no middle roads of discussion and argument and the subtlety of how would we have done things differently. You're writing a letter to the 17-year-old Ajay Shah. 
What are you going to say? Uh, our friend Divyanshu popped a question to me in a podcast conversation and he popped it out of the blue. Like with zero notice, he said, uh, tell me one mistake you made in your life. Okay, and with zero notice, I said the following. I said that uh, not age 17, but age 21. At age 21, I graduated from IIT and uh, the great economist Kirit Parikh said to me, you're a good child, come apprentice with me for some years. Okay, and he says, after that, you can go get a PhD, you can do whatever you want, but work with me for a couple of years. And uh, I was so stupid. I was glamorized about studying in the United States and starting a PhD. You know, I thought PhD was a big thing that I actually turned him down and I went abroad to do a PhD. And in hindsight, that was the dumbest decision imaginable. Like I could have had a couple of years apprenticing with him, like literally getting one-on-one -on -one time with him four times a week. And that would have been the greatest education in the world possible. And instead, I chose a stupid path of credentialism and the glamour of the United States. I have a quiz question for you. Who said the following words? It's not that I'm so smart. It's just that I stay with problems longer. No, I don't know. Let me give you a clue. It is someone who achieved such spectacular, staggering things at a very young age that you would not imagine that someone like this is talking about perseverance and saying I'm not smart. And he's one of your heroes. No, I don't know. You have mentioned him in previous episodes. <laughs> this is getting harder. Uh, okay, what, what clue can I possibly uh, give here? Uh, okay, forget it. It's Albert Einstein. Yeah. So, uh, it is said of Einstein that at age 16, he put his mind to one problem. Where he started thinking that if I was riding a beam of light, what would the world look like? And he just stayed on that one problem for years and years. And one fine day, he, it reached special relativity. What a mind-blowing question to begin with. And Confucius once said, it doesn't matter how slowly you go, as long as you don't stop. So, which is another ode to uh, sort of perseverance. And Vivian Green once said something beautiful where she said that, don't wait for the storms to pass, learn to dance in the rain. You know, so how important is it to sort of, um, you know, what are the ways in which you've adjusted your own mindset you had phases where you've been in government you've been phases where you're out of government you've been you had phases where you know you've been an insider you've been an outsider um how have you so and and you've been in different parts of the ecosystem at different times you know how important is it to keep improvising because one part of perseverance says stick with it another part of perseverance is don't be rigid look around learn to dance in the rain so it is easy to try to say stick with narrow career paths. So uh, I I had a mentor and boss at the Ministry of Finance who had a very clear career track for me once. And it was obvious to him that this was the right one. But I always felt that the right path for me is in the world of knowledge, not in the world of action. And so, you know, I made many choices and we each of us have to find our locale and I always felt that the locale where I am the most useful is the world of knowledge. That my thing is, I know how to read books and write books. I know how to do research. I am a creature of data and statistics. That's what I do. So I always felt that my role of this puzzle is to work with data and do research and write some books and build some ideas. And it, it uh, fills me with surprise that I've ended up here in front of a camera in this show with you. I never expected that would happen. This is the final piece of the puzzle. Shop ki chu, shop ki chu. Everything is everything, as the great Robida would say. Yeah. So I think we each of us have to find our appropriate zone of uh, peace and safety. I've also known uh, the crushing humiliation of the, the crushing humiliation and misery of many of my uh, areas of work going horribly wrong. It's happened over and over. And it hurts. It is absolutely horrible when that happens. It is easy to lash out and be angry at the ingrates of the world that mess up the beautiful things that one has done. But then, you know, you just have to grow up and reconcile that uh, the world owes you nothing. And uh, the best ideas and dreams will go terribly wrong. And that's just how the world is. And we have to keep on trying. That our job is to build knowledge and keep pushing and accept some good things and bad things that will come out of it and you don't have the right to ask for anything.
So Ajay, what's your recommendation for this episode? Uh, my recommendation for today is a book by James C. Scott, which is called Weapons of the Weak. Okay, so uh, I talked about how everything taught to us in childhood about the transition from a hunter-gatherer life to an agricultural life was actually a terrible decline that is modern thinking and that's jointly in the book Against the Grain that we have recommended in this show before and Weapons of the Weak. So this whole vision that states have emerged to tax and conscript the people and for a lot of people it's better to say like hell no and keep the state away from their life and this is there's more than a shadow of this in a large part of the indian society where people just want to keep far far away from the government in any way shape or form marvelous and on this show we've not, not just recommended against the grain but also seeing like a state so very much a james c scott uh, fan club though we i haven't read the weapons of the week so i shall absolutely look forward to doing so And Amit, tell us, what is your fun book recommendation for today? I'm not sure it is fun, but nor is it, you know, related to our episode. It's not about the state and it's not about, you know, perseverance or anything um, like that. My favorite living writer is this great short story writer called Alice Munro. Uh, remarkable writer. You know, all her stories are really set in a particular province of Canada. But they capture the human condition so beautifully that she's beloved all over the world. Won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Just shows that literature everywhere speaks to everyone. And uh, two particular books of short stories I will recommend are Runaway and Hateship, Courtship, Friendship, Loveship, Marriage. Both are masterpieces. And uh, my favorite short story of all time, perhaps, which is just magnificent, is uh, the short story called The Bear Came Over the Mountain. And we will link it from the show notes because it was published in the New Yorker and you can read it for free. Uh, so again, you know, move away from thoughts of the state and change and economics and politics and et cetera, et cetera. And just immerse yourself in a good work of fiction because every good work of fiction is about you. <laughs>